They say it's impossible to fold a piece of paper more than eight times. To test this myth, Carly grabbed a sheet of paper and started folding. Sure enough, by the seventh fold, the paper was about the size of a smartphone and so thick that it couldn't be folded any further. But what if you used a larger sheet of paper? Could you go beyond eight folds? So they brought out a 12 by 15 inch sheet to test the idea. The theory was that a larger sheet would be easier to fold. By the third fold, they noticed the paper was shrinking at an incredible rate. By the seventh fold, it took an enormous amount of pressure just to get it to fold. For the eighth fold, they had to use tools to hammer it down. At this point, it seemed the myth was true. To break the curse of the eighth fold, they needed an even bigger piece of paper. The plan? Use a sheet the size of a standard soccer field for the ultimate test, but no single sheet that large exists, so they had to piece one together. After three days and nights of effort, the world's largest sheet of paper was finally created. The ultimate folding test was about to begin. Everyone lifted one end of the massive sheet and carefully pulled it to the other side. Because of its enormous size, every step had to be done with caution. They folded it down in a precise 90-degree direction each time. By the seventh fold, the paper had become incredibly heavy. Just one more fold and the myth would be shattered. As expected, the bigger the sheet, the easier it was to fold, at least at first. The myth was officially busted, but they didn't stop there. At that point, human strength alone wasn't enough to make another fold, so they brought in a steamroller. In the end, they didn't just break the eight-fold limit. They reached an astonishing 11 folds, possibly a new Guinness World Record. They say it's possible to ride a bicycle underwater. To test that claim, Adam jumped straight into the water without hesitation. At first, he found that riding a bike underwater felt almost the same as on land except there was way more resistance, making it much harder to pedal. But at this point, his whole body wasn't fully submerged, so it didn't count as true underwater cycling. So he headed toward deeper water. Before long, the bike began to float. Then the rear tire lost traction, throwing him off balance and sending him crashing into the water. Adam figured the floating issue was due to the bike being too light, so he added 20 kilograms of extra weight to it. At first, things went smoothly. But once he reached the bottom of a slope, the same problem returned. The rear wheel spun in place with no grip, and he couldn't move forward. The result? Another fall into the water. It seemed that just adding weight wasn't enough to solve the problem. Tire traction clearly mattered, too. So Adam filled the tires with corn syrup. This allowed the tires to fully expand and make better contact with the ground. He also added 25 kilograms of lead pellets into the bike frame, increasing the weight without changing its structure. Jimmy, on the other hand, took a more conservative approach. He added two training wheels to the rear for stability. Then, to balance things out, he placed a 25-kilogram barbell on the front wheel. Which design worked better? That was up to the next test. Jimmy went first. The first half of the ride went smoothly. But once he hit the uphill section, things got tough fast. Though his rear wheel didn't spin out thanks to the modifications, the added weight made it nearly impossible to keep pedaling. Next up was Adam. His setup wasn't much different from the original, and once again the rear wheel spun without grip, ending with him falling into the water. After several rounds of testing, the conclusion was clear. You can't ride a bicycle underwater. Myth busted. They say that while driving on the highway, some jerk threw a plastic cup out of his car window. It just happened to hit a car on the opposite side of the road, shattering the windshield and striking the driver directly. To find out if this really could happen, the team set up an air cannon indoors. One end of a steel pipe is connected to a specially designed built-in pressure tank. When the valve is opened, compressed air blasts the object out the other end at high speed, sending it straight into a steel plate equipped with a force sensor. They're testing three different substances to see which one delivers the biggest impact. First, they ran a trial using a cup full of ice just to make sure everything was working properly. <laughs> and wow, compressed air really is powerful. The cup shot out of the cannon at an incredible 190 miles per hour. To make sure all the tests fire at the same speed, they calculated and adjusted the starting position of each cup. Once everything was set, the first test, soda without ice. Okay. The cup blasted out and slammed into the steel plate. The reading? 3,668 pounds of force at 132 miles per hour. Next up, soda with ice. Once again, the impact was spectacular. Even though the weight difference was small, the increase in force was noticeably higher. Finally, it was time for the slushy. It burst into a beautiful spray of blue, like a firework thanking everyone for watching, and officially took the crown in this soda showdown. Now, the slushy is stepping up as the batter for the full-scale experiment. It's said that when a ping-pong ball reaches a certain speed, its impact can rival that of a bullet. To test this claim, Adam built an air-powered ping-pong ball cannon. At maximum pressure, the ball could only reach a speed of 140 miles per hour. But that wasn't nearly fast enough. 
so he decided to go bigger, much bigger. He built an 80-foot-long barrel and attached a larger air tank. One. With this setup, the ping-pong ball blasted straight through honeycomb cardboard and even left a visible dent on the wooden board behind it. The speed? A staggering 450 miles per hour. To show just how powerful that is, he set up a glass of red wine as a target. Before the ball even appeared, the wine exploded into the air as if it had evaporated. Then the ball came through, and everything was obliterated. It was fast, but still not fast enough. After consulting with physicists, they came up with a new method. All it required was a 36-inch PVC pipe. First, a ping-pong ball is placed inside. Then both ends of the pipe are sealed with tape. Next, all the air inside is sucked out, creating a vacuum. When one end is punctured, Whoa! the pressure difference causes the ball to launch forward instantly. That's the theory anyway. In practice, the ball vanished in the blink of an eye. The test was a huge success. After a few technical adjustments, what? they managed to push the speed to 375 miles per hour, but they still weren't satisfied. They tried applying the same technique to the original 80-foot barrel. What happened next was totally unexpected. The ping-pong ball stopped right at the barrel's exit. So, what went wrong? It's said that spraying starter fluid into a flat tire and igniting it can reset the tire onto the rim and instantly inflate it. To test this myth, Carrie started with a small tire. Just like in the videos, she sprayed starter fluid around the inside edge of the tire and lit it. But the result was disappointing. Igniting it didn't inflate the tire at all. It wasn't until Tori stepped on the tire a few times, helping the starter fluid mix more thoroughly with the air, that things started to change. Carrie lit the tire again, and this time it quickly inflated. However, the tire kept expanding after inflation, scaring everyone into quickly backing away. Once the tire cooled down, they discovered something strange. All the air inside had been sucked out. It had turned into a vacuum. Just a light touch made it collapse. At this point, the myth wasn't looking too good. But the test wasn't over yet. Next, they tried it on a heavy-duty truck tire. Once again, Carrie sprayed starter fluid and lit it. The tire inflated quickly, but after it cooled, it deflated back to its original state. So while fire can inflate a tire momentarily, it doesn't hold. This method is unreliable and seriously dangerous. Don't try this at home. Myth officially busted. It's said that a skydiver once couldn't open his parachute while descending and happened to crash into a seesaw in a park. The impact supposedly launched a little girl on the other end all the way onto the rooftop of a seven-story building. Miraculously, the girl survived. To test this myth, Adam built a seesaw made of steel. He calculated that dropping a 1,150-pound barrel of water from a height of 75 feet would create an impact force similar to a skydiver free-falling from 85,000 feet. The dummy placed on the other end of the seesaw weighed as much as a seven-year-old girl. Once everything was ready, the barrel was released and dropped onto the seesaw. But instead of the dummy being launched seven stories into the air, the seesaw snapped in half. The massive impact didn't transfer to the dummy at all, so the experiment had to be redesigned. First, the seesaw needed to be rebuilt to withstand the force and transfer the energy without breaking. Second, they needed to know the exact terminal velocity of a falling skydiver. Grant got the data from the Skydiving Association. Terminal velocity can reach up to 122 miles per hour, but only after falling from at least 600 feet. At that altitude, hitting a seesaw dead on would be extremely difficult. That's where special bungee cords come in. Widely used in bungee jumping, they're highly elastic and can rebound objects quickly. Meanwhile, the reinforced seesaw was finally ready. The test site? The well-known shipyard. Now everything's in place. All that's left is to test it. Do you think this myth will be confirmed? Conspiracy theories claimed that the 1969 moon landing was a hoax. Adam decided to test these rumors through a series of experiments. He recreated a set nearly identical to the lunar surface shown in NASA's official moon landing photos. One popular conspiracy theory pointed out that the shadows in the pictures aren't parallel under what should be a single light source, claiming that the photos were taken in a studio. To uncover the truth, Adam built a miniature moon landscape, replicating every detail as accurately as possible. Through continuous comparison and adjustment, he and his team managed to recreate a scene that looked almost identical to NASA's original moon landing images. Most importantly, Adam used only a single light source. The result? Two non-parallel shadows still appear, proving that it's entirely possible for shadows to diverge even under a single light source. The reason lies in the uneven lunar terrain, which affects the direction of shadows. This effectively debunked that particular conspiracy theory, but skeptics weren't done yet. 
They argued that the astronaut in one specific photo appeared far too clearly lit. They claimed that with only the sun as a light source, the astronaut should appear in shadow, or at least much dimmer. To test this, Adam built a model of the lunar lander and a replica of the moon's environment based on detailed data provided by NASA. Even the dust and particles used in the model were supplied by NASA, as these directly relate to the moon's surface reflectivity. Every detail had to be nearly perfect to get close to the real optical conditions on the moon. After several rounds of adjustments, they finally captured a photo that closely matched the original. The astronaut appeared clearly visible under a single light source, just like in NASA's image. Conspiracy theorists insisted he should have been in the dark, but the reality was the opposite. With the moon's unique reflective surface, which has a specific refractive index, the astronaut was clearly illuminated even with only one light source. And with that, another conspiracy theory was definitively debunked.